George Smith Patton Jr. was one of the greatest tank corps commanders of all time. His exploits were the stuff of legend. His strict discipline, toughness, and self-sacrifice elicited major pride in his men, and his men would follow old blood and guts anywhere. But sometimes Patton's brash, brash actions and exploding temper created some very cantankerous and controversial times in his life, especially in his military life. Patton graduated from West Point, was born in a family of privilege, but he always was dreamed of being in the military. In 1912, he represented the U.S. in the Olympic Games in a pentathlon, where he placed fifth out of 42. He was a master of the sword, as designated by that title, and he designed his own sword for his Army Corps and cavalry, which then became tank. It was called the Patton Sword. He accompanied John J. Pershing on a quest chasing Pancho Villa through the Mexican desert. Uh, in World War I, he became America's first tank commander where he won a medal and went well beyond the call of duty. World War II was where Patton was to fulfill his destiny. Patton's first command was the landings at Casablanca, taking, then taking over command of two corps and reversing their fortunes in battle. He quickly moved to Sicily where he flanked Monty's army, but decided to go ahead and take Palermo and Messina himself. Patton was actually waiting on Monty in Messina when Monty and his army arrived. After being reprimanded in the Italian campaign, Patton was beached, honestly thinking he was never going to get to fight in that major battle in a major war that he so thought was his destiny. But he soon found himself in England across from the Pas de Calais overseeing a dummy army and all but nothing. <laughs> After D-Day, he was surprised when he was appointed to command 3rd Army on his march across France. In a short time, Patton had pushed all the way to the Metz on the Rhine River and was preparing to cross. But Omar Bradley stopped him and cut off all his supplies. That was when Patton's blitzkrieg slowed to a crawl. He had almost overextended his logistics and supply train. In December 1944, in the Ardennes Forest, the Panzer divisions opened up a counterattack, which was known as the Battle of the Bulge. And this was one of Patton's finest hours. Trapped in Bastogne, the 101st Airborne led by General McCullough, was surrounded by Germans, but they would not surrender. Patton had foreseen this to a point and made the fastest 180 degree or 90 degree turn of an army in history. In a few days, Third Army had reached Bastogne and had relieved the 101st of their burden and thus the Battle of the Bulge was effectively over. Patton was also steeped in controversy as well as myth. He shot two mules one time because they were in the way. He found an unwounded soldier in a hospital where he was giving wounded soldiers medals. When he realized his unwounded soldier was suffering from Nothing but shell shock. He slapped the guy repeatedly and then told him he was sending him to the front lines. 
These actions likely cost him a command role in the D-Day invasion. Patton was one of the greatest military commanders of the U.S. history, as well as the most complex and contradictory commander in U.S. history. Patton believed a general should stand out and be seen by his troops. A philosophy that coincided with his ex exploits, a devout Christian who dressed impeccably and was a loose mouth with the use of profanity. Patton believed he was a reincarnated commander from antiquity, and Patton possessed a genius for war that was totally battle-centric. Only a rare few commanders in history had this. Patton also could communicate with his men. He had a silver tongue of sorts. Some of his more famous quotes were, a pint of sweat will save a gallon of blood. Lead me, follow me, or s get out of the way. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan next week. These were but a few of his famous quotes. They show his mindset on the battlefield. He led by example, hit hard, hit fast, kept the enemy on their heels so they could not plan a counterattack or an offensive against him. Patton took the best of German Blitzkrieg and perfected that, making it his own. The Germans considered Patton one of the most dangerous adversaries on the field. Most believed Patton the best aggressive Panzer general of the Allies. Even Heinz Guderian, one of the Wehrmacht's greatest tank commanders, was very impressed with Patton. Patton, though successful in France, was largely hindered by his boss, Omar Bradley, a slow plotting general who was and should have still been under Patton. But Omar Bradley was a kiss ass inept commander, in my opinion. Patton behaved and believed in luck, but he created luck by his meticulous planning, his intuition, ability to be in the right spot at the right time, his intelligence, and all of this made Patton what I call battle-centric. Patton was a military governor briefly after the Germans surrendered, but Patton believed that the Allies should have kept on going to Moscow. Patton saw something in the Russians he didn't trust, but his warnings were unheeded, and a 40-year-old Cold War was waiting in the wings. Patton died from a freak car accident, suffering injuries he soon died from. General George S. Patton, old blood and guts, led by example, loved and hated by his men, who would follow him into the gates of hell. A swearing Christian who believed in reincarnation, he left an indelible mark on history. He left an un believable mark on history and the battlefields of World War II cementing his place in the annals of military history as one of the greatest tank battalion commanders of all time. This is Big Duke Six from the Cool Cake Newsroom. Until next time.